Hi, my name is Mark Johnson and this is part three of my short introduction to thinking in education and technology and today I want to talk about writing and thinking. So what is it to write? I've got here a, a drawing by the artist Paul Clay. When we think about writing it's perhaps sensible to start thinking about drawing first because it is drawing that we do first when we're children. Just try and imagine what it's like to be a child and to have a pen in your hand and to start making marks on the paper. The process of thoughts that go through your mind as the pictures emerge. Paul Clay talked about taking a line for a walk. In the Chinese tradition there's always been a very deep uh, fascination and a cultural importance to the art of calligraphy which is something that stands between writing and drawing. What is the experience of the calligrapher as they paint these symbols on the paper? Why is calligraphic art so highly praised in Chinese culture? Today of course we use word processors and the experience of using a word processor is very different from the experience of using pen and paper. When we use a word processor we have to find new ways to think and write and word processors may sometimes get in the way of initial exploratory thinking. You might be better to do it on paper, but they are good for transcribing partially formed ideas. Just as a little exercise, imagine you're writing a paragraph. You don't know exactly what the paragraph is about yet, but you start typing, and you finish the first sentence, and you read it back to yourself, and then you think, oh, I can add something more, so you add the next sentence. And then you reread what you've written, and you think there's more to say, so you keep going, but eventually you realize, ah, oh, I know what this is about. And so you write the final sentence which summarizes what it's about. In my graph here, I've tried to draw in the black line that initial experience of writing. So you can see I start with this fairly low level line at the beginning, and it says sentence one in black. Then I move on to sentence two, which rises a bit, and then sentence three, which rises a bit more. And then finally I reach this peak where I know, aha, this is what it's about. Okay, and then I can stop that paragraph and um, probably move on to the next paragraph. Now the red line that I've produced there is suggesting that actually when you reread this paragraph, it feels a bit wishy-washy because you go through those thought processes and it never quite says what it's about until you get to the end. So a useful technique is once you've written a paragraph like that, you look at whatever you've said in the last sentence or near the last sentence, and you take it away from the end and stick it at the beginning. And suddenly you have a graph that looks like the red line, where your paragraphs begin with a real punch, and then they elaborate on what it is that has led to that punch after you had your first sentence. I've always found this a useful technique for managing the way I feel when I write. Like any writer, like anybody who tries to write things down, I often write something or start writing something, read it back and think it's not very good. And I need a technique for helping me to feel better about it and restructure what I've written uh, in a more effective way. And I do this by looking at the last sentence of any paragraph that I've written and putting it at the front of my paragraph and it changes the punchiness of that particular paragraph. This week I want you to do uh, a task that's using the result of the assignment that you did in week one for me. I want you to write a very short 300 word paragraph but I'm not interested in that paragraph on its own. I'm actually interested in the process you go through in writing that paragraph. So what I want you to do for me is to send me seven snapshots of the paragraph as it's being written. So there'll be a snapshot at the beginning, maybe with the first sentence, a snapshot, a snapshot with the second sentence, another one with the third sentence, uh, maybe another one after you've finished, and then finally you'll start to move the words around, maybe move the last sentence to the beginning, and so on. I want to see that process in the way that you write. Now, this is the way that I write, and I'm just going to really talk you through the process of writing something. I don't know what I'm going to write yet, but I'm, you know, I'm beginning to write. 
And this is the process of what I'm going through. So what shall I say? Well, um, I'm going to come back to the question. Now this is what I want you to do. This is my question, if you remember. Why is education usually rubbish? So I'm going to write a paragraph about this. How am I going to do it? Uh, so I'm going to say something like, the nature of educational experience is... No, no, I'm not going to say that. Maybe it's better to say educational experiences can be variable. Okay, so that's just saying everybody has a different experience of education, um, and that's a problem. The factors which lead them to be so include variation in the quality of the teaching, variation in... Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm getting into a vibe now. I can keep on writing variation. I can, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying making these words on, well, it's on the screen in my case, but I'm, I'm enjoying sort of how this feels and looks. It's kind of flowing. So I'm talking about all the different kinds of variation. Variation in the ability of peers. What other kinds of variation can I think of? But it doesn't matter. I'll just leave that. And, okay, so we've got another question now. So now I've got another question. I've got more to write. How can we deal with the variation problem? Uh, variations can be addressed through increased standardization. Yes, okay, so I, know I can now get a feel, okay, so we've gone from why is education rubbish to the problem of variation, dealing with variation through standardization. So what are the kind of standardizations might I be interested in? Well, I can list these types of resources, streaming of children with different abilities. Um, it's kind of standardizing the input. Um, standard practices for addressing learner development and maybe behavior okay so I've got I've got the, the paragraph is kind of building up out of these lists um, many of these issues are addressed through um, initiatives around educational quality that's what we need to say yes now so this is this about quality this whole question about why is education rubbish is is all about quality um, and quality interventions in many countries. Okay, let's talk about that because we can list those. Resulted in inspection regimes, tracking the quality of record keeping, standardizing assessments against a variety of uh, learning outcomes. You know, learning outcomes are very important for quality. Um, regular testing in national league tables. Um, for the relative comparison of the effectiveness of teaching and learning. Okay, so, so something's beginning to shape up here. Um, but we have here all these things, but education is still usually rubbish. Okay, so that, that may be a feel for this problem, because we're doing all of these things. We're doing all of this quality measurement and measuring this and measuring that, but it's still not very good. Why not? Would it, it feels, as it, is it more rubbish than it would have been without these processes? That's, that's the question. What's the problem? Okay, I'm losing my way here a bit now because I'm kind of realizing it was quite complicated. So my paragraph is, but the nature of the interventions taken in the name of quality are interventions to constrain the practice or constrain practices. They're constraining the practice of teachers. To some extent, they're constraining the practice of learners. And then a new question, is that the only way to do this? Is that the only way to um, raise the quality of experience. Is there a way of improving quality by m removing constraints on teachers? Is education rubbish because we don't trust teachers? Okay, so I've got that text and now I'm going to type it up. So this is me using the word processor literally to, um, to transcribe. Transcribe what are, is effectively a partially formed idea. So I'm, I'm going to type down um, education experience can be variable. The factors that lead it to be so include the quality in uh, so variation in what does that say? Variation in the quality of teaching, variation of resources, variation in the classroom. Um, how might we deal with variation? Is variation the problem? Variation can be addressed through increased standardization. Um, standardization of course, uh, resources, streaming of children, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and many of these issues are addressed. I'm not thinking here as I'm doing this. I'm literally copying down what I've written on paper because I know that something of what I've written on paper will make a, a more polished paragraph. I know that this paragraph that's coming out right now is not terribly poli polished. 
And what I now need to do is get it into the word processor and start moving bits around so that I can make it much, much tighter in the way that it expresses what I want to say. So I've got down to, but we have all these things, but education is still usually rubbish. Indeed, it feels it's more ru um, more rubbish than it would have been without these processes. What's the problem? I think there's a little bit more to come. The nature of the interventions taken in the name of quality interventions to constrain practice. So this idea of constraint, I've italicized it there because I think that's probably important. Is that the only way to do it? Is there a way of improving quality by removing constraints on teachers? Is there a way of trusting teachers more? Okay, so we've got this paragraph. Um, it, it's okay, but I think it could be a lot better. And my first point of look, making it better is to look at where I end up in my last sentence. Or it may not be the last sentence, maybe the last but, but one. The nature of the interventions taken in the name of quality are interventions to constrain practice. And that gives me my first sentence now, which I feel now is what this is really about. Quality interventions in education typically constrain practice. And then we can to talk about, well, why do they constrain practice? Because they're trying to avoid problems of variation in the quality of teaching and variation in resources. And then I can say, well, what do they do? Typically, uh, measures increase standardization in various ways, colon all the different ways in which standardization can be raised. Now you can see this first paragraph now has real punch. Quality interventions in education typically constrain practice. Really? What do you mean? How does that work? Okay, uh, well they do so to avoid problems of variation in the quality of resources and teaching practice um, and these measures uh, take the form of and so on. Now I'm just going through this, reading it over and over again, thinking actually we can make this a bit tighter, we need to talk about curriculum. We, uh, I'm deleting a f quite a lot of stuff because it just it doesn't need to be there anymore. So I'm looking at the second paragraph. So we are talking about constraints and issues around these constraints on practice have been well studied in the literature. Yes, because I, I know I can now start looking for the different ways in which um, people constrain practice. So I'm just thinking, what do I do with that second paragraph? And we need to, in the, the end of the first paragraph, perhaps we need to introduce it. So among the consequences of greater standardization are the ability to make national and international comparisons, like the PISA studies, of educational development, um, producing competition between schools for self improvement. So, uh, just looking through this now again. However, despite these initiatives, so now this flows from the first paragraph, despite these initiatives, educational experience can be highly variable. Indeed, it's difficult to be able to ascertain whether educational experience is any better because of the interventions than it would be without them. Um, so this is actually, this is, I've, it's almost as if I've created a new paragraph that leads into the paragraph that I initially started writing, which was about... Um, uh, variation. So constraints around teacher practice may have negative consequences in the way they restrict the range of options that a teacher has as they seek to act effectively in teaching and learning situations. Added to that, the standardising of assessments and rigidity of learning outcomes can result in inauthentic practices by teachers which are oriented towards passing the test and fulfilling the requirements of performance metrics rather than the concrete learning needs of individual learners. Okay, now that's that's beginning to look a bit. Now I'm going to start getting rid of stuff. Um, uh, this third paragraph then is probably needs a bit more attention. Now I'm going to change the title because I think the title is um, I mean, we don't want to, if it's a proper academic piece of work, then you don't really want to use words like rubbish. Um, although, uh, one day I probably will. Is there a way of improving quality by removing constraints on teachers and not increasing them? What would an education system that governed itself on this principle look like? Those are good questions. It's good to sort of end this kind of passage with, with some difficult questions. The deep problem is that what is constrained in teaching practice are the measurable aspects of teaching and learning. 
but what if we could make visible the less tangible aspects of learner experience? And here I'm thinking about things like technologies. Um, so there's, it's opening up a discussion. Human social organisation requires some kind of standardisation and agreement between practitioners. So we're not saying that you, you, you shouldn't have standardisation. But perhaps we should be more scientific in our approach to understanding the things that we really are measuring. Um, so we look through that and just, just make a few more changes here. Yeah, so this is a more general paragraph now. So human social organisation, including the organisation of education, requires some kind of standardisation. That goes to the front. So again, I've, I've taken the last sentence and stuck it at the beginning of the paragraph. However, the level of scientific understanding of learning experiences and the capacity to monitor that experience is fairly crude. It is for this reason that surface measures like learning outcomes are seen as the benchmarks of quality. Here we ask whether a more scientific approach to learning might provide a more authentic ground for educational coordination. Would it provide a way of removing constraints on teachers would it instead introduce new constraints on teachers that cause them to act inauthentically in new ways? So that's, that's a bit of critique of our own position there. Now let's change the title. Constraints and educational quality, some fundamental questions. That's good enough. Okay, so um, right, that's the process. That's my writing process and I'm still fiddling with it, but you get the idea. So it's, it's literally from working on paper, just jotting ideas down, transcribing them into the word process and then having these techniques like taking the last sentence of a paragraph and sticking it in the front um, to see if that gives, gives the argument more punch and gives the whole thing more momentum. Okay, so I hope uh, you enjoy doing this. I'm sure you'll find it difficult. Um, I find it difficult, but I also quite enjoy the challenge.